Okay, yes, we have sound. Hey, hey, y'all. So today, I'm with Sparkles. Say hi, Sparkles. Hi. And we're going to be talking about a specific chapter from A Thousand Plateaus. So all the Deleuzean, Guattarian people out there should be excited about this, provided you have the patience to listen to this after having read it, or, you know, if you want to look at this or listen to this before reading it. Um, but before we get started, maybe Sparkles would like to say something about themselves. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, currently a master's student at Boston College, um, finishing up a master's degree in uh, philosophy, um, and I think I sort of chose to do this text mostly because I'm currently writing on it, um, and I'm a, a big fan of the intersection of music and philosophy, uh, despite everything philosophy has to say that's mean about music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get in some weird territory. We aren't going to talk about Adorno today, but there would be things to say for sure. Um, but anyways, yeah, but besides that, what what got you into Deleuze and Guattari? Uh, my undergraduate um, thesis advisor is a sort of Deleuzean naturalist, uh, and every time I uh, tried to write a paper, he kept saying, you know, Deleuze wrote about that. That might be helpful for you. And after the fifth paper where he said that, I eventually you kind took of caught it. on, <laughs> kind of caught figured on. it out, and ah, fine, okay. Uh, and I've sort of been writing about Deleuze ever since. Yeah, oh, that's uh, that seems like a good enough reason. I feel like for my own part, you know, the breach into grad school was really just a um, you know a following up of everything or the big influences in my, you know, my undergrad, so, and that way we don't stray too far from the herd. But, anyways, getting into this, this fun chapter that I'm sure will take as much time <laughs> as, you know, as time will allot us. We'll get to the cosmos in this one. How would you like to proceed? Do you want to tell me your initial thoughts? Uh, I guess I just sort of want to frame the way that I would talk about this chapter. Um, so, one of the problems you encounter with a Thousand Plateaus is the way that it's written. Uh, every chapter traverses one another. Um, the central chapters can be read out of order. Uh, arguments will spill over into other chapters. And I, I thought it'd be important to sort of focus just on this chapter, try to, to limit it not to the questions of the book as a whole, but sort of what he's trying to do with this chapter and why he organizes it as a plateau. Um, and I think a couple sort of words are required beforehand to understand what's going on here. Uh, Deleuze himself is not a big music person, uh, but he was close friends with the guitarist uh, Richard Pinhas, and one of his students is a musicologist uh, who cites Deleuze as an inspiration for her piano works, uh, Pascal Crichton. Uh, Deleuze himself makes no claim to pretense to musical knowledge. Uh, however, he did take a class under Pierre Boulez, who's a prominent scholar of Messiaen and a composer in his own right. Um, he actually took a class on musical time with Bart and Foucault, uh, which is quite a class to take. <laughs> um, much of the chapter is actually from Guattari, and a lot of it derives from Guattari's own book, The Machinic Unconscious, which was published the year before. Uh, where he first articulates the concept of the refrain. Um, and a lot of the book draws, a lot of this, this particular part of the book draws heavily on uh, a number of biologists who Guattari had become sort of obsessed with in the years leading up to the writing of the book. Um, and there's another book that sort of forms the backbone of this chapter, and that's Claude Samuel's Conversations with Oliver Messiaen. It's the sort of really important figure that marks the second half of the chapter. Yeah, I think that's the way to start. So in the in broad terms, before we, you know, narrow it down a bit, what is a refrain? Uh, so the, the French word is uh, ritornel, uh, but it's actually drawn from an Italian word, uh, ritorno. I don't know how to 
pronounce any of these because I'm an American, so. <laughs> uh, but it derives either from the word retorno or tornado, uh, so a return or a turnaround or a flourish. Uh, it's actually the final line of a madrigal, uh, which is a secular voice piece uh, and meant to be emotionally expressive. But the most important thing about it, it is, that, is that this final line is completely non-repetitive. It's uh, through composed, as be the musical term for it. Um, so what a word that sounds like repetition actually means the complete absence of repetition. And this becomes the sort of foundation, uh, foundational concept that he's trying to lay out throughout this whole uh, chapter. He sort of divides it into three aspects, but he gives them uh, historical names. Uh, so he divides it into the classical, the romantic, and the modern ages. Uh, but he also he gives a number of repetitive accounts of what these divisions are. Uh, so the classical, romantic, modern becomes mapped onto what he calls chaos, the world, and the cosmic, which he describes at the very beginning of the chapter with three scenes. The first is a child alone in the dark uh, who starts singing to themselves to impose a certain amount of form onto the world uh, to give them a sense of stability. A point in the world to hold on to. And this is a kind of tentative point that could collapse at any moment. And this is the classical or the, the chaotic imposing uh, of form onto matter. Uh, the second romantic world he describes as the drawing of a circle, the marshalling of chaos. An example he gives is the a housewife who turns on the radio to give a repetition, to do chores, to take this space, this domestic space, and organize it, constitute it into a place. And then the final stage, the cosmic, is the rendering visible of invisible forces, or the venturing home on the thread of a tune, uh, venturing from home on the thread of a tune. Uh, and the example he eventually gives is lobster migrations, <laughs> that they uh, there's a film of Jacques Cousteau's where he narrates this incredible lobster migration of uh, thousands of miles where the, mob, the lobsters march one by one uh, along the sea. Um, and so he, he calls these the three aspects of the refrain. They're not chronological. They're all always together at once in this completely non-repetitive act. What, for you, to keep it, well, to stay a little broad as well, because th this particular chapter stood out to me a little bit, in that prior to it, I saw something as difficult that is, as it is to say, something about pragmatics, or something that pointed me in a direction towards change, to use a rather vulgar term in like this, in the Deleuzean context, but what is it about music, or music specifically, because Deleuze and Guitard make the distinction between art and music, and how they don't do the same thing, and I, it strikes me as odd, because, you know, I'm reading the first few chapters of this, the first ten chapters, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I can liken this in some ways to the perhaps the Kantian notion of the sublime. So just thinking about art and how it can induce these kinds of feelings, perhaps be a deterritorializing force, to use that term vulgarly. But what is it about music specifically that that sets itself apart from art for you? Well, I think when he's talking about art in this chapter, He's really limiting himself to painting. Right. He doesn't mean right. sculptural art. He doesn't mean ah. art in the grand Hegelian sense of, I'm going to give some giant theory of how all of this interlinks together through history, as Hegel does, where he reduces everything to just the march of history. Uh, instead, he's really trying to focus on 
the relationship that music has to space, has to the world around it, and the fact that music can only really be understood in reference to actual events that are taking place around it. Uh, so, he says, you know, the, the problem with the flag for nationalism is that the flag on its own doesn't do it. It needs the trumpet to accompany it. It needs the whole space to be oriented around the flag and organized in a particular kind of way in order for a flag to have meaning. And painting requires this too, but it doesn't show it in the same way. It doesn't reveal the necessity of its surroundings. Right. And in Deleuze's terms, on page 347, he puts it as follows, so, or he, in the form of a question, why this privileging of the ear, when even animals and birds present us with so many visual, chromatic, postural, and gestural refrains, which your answer, I think, is totally uh, acceptable for, and it, it, it does get it something interesting because like in the other analogy they give is that color is one thing that color on its own does nothing color can't induce that for anyone interested that's the sound of a train so don't be worried uh color doesn't have that it, it there isn't really a ref, there can't be a refrain in color i don't think but then again i might be speaking too quickly Sparkles is going through, you know, what's the... Uh, so, so one of the things that sort of frames this is uh, somebody I mentioned already, uh, Messiaen, um, who's this composer who is talked about a fair amount in the, the text, um, who does these piano pieces inspired by bird songs that he calls transcriptions of bird songs. But... One of the important contexts for this chapter is the fact that Messiaen talks extensively about the relationship between color and sound, and in fact goes so far uh, as to claim that he's a kind of synesthetic, uh, synes, 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 I don't know what the word is, synesthesiac? I, I don't know. I might go there. I keep, keep going. Um, and, uh, and actually pairs pitch with color. Uh, he's, got, he's quoted as having a very sort of funny line of um, saying the, the problem with drug users is that they too quickly associate uh, color and noise. They don't take the time to really parse out what color constitutes this particular harmony that persists for this long. And they don't really do the work of pairing color and tone. Uh, so this is a really big uh, question for the whole chapter, is what's this relationship that's going on uh, between color and tone? Uh, and part of it's about the question of making something visible. To give this color to sound is to suggest a kind of making visible of something in sound that isn't visible. And this is so much of what he believes the third component of the return of, of the refrain is. It's this making visible the invisible forces of sound. And I, it, that would lead me to a point of confusion for me. Because it seems almost like by doing that, by opening up this possible terrain to make things visible, it's almost working against A Thousand Plateaus as a whole, where it seems to me as though there should be, in my conception of where Deleuze's concepts and, and Guattari's concepts are going, it seems as though there should be something of a commitment to the invisible or things that can't, can't necessarily be explained. So it strikes me as ironic that, you know, they establish there being all these kinds of deterritorialized, territorialized, unknown knowns, and then they say that and then say, here's a whole taxonomy to then get at it. It seems like it's, it does it a disservice in a sense. Well, one of the things that's a classic Deleuzean move is to take a thinker 
and try to flush out a line of thought from them to produce something new. Uh, and I think that's where this taxonomy comes from, is it's implicit, but the chapter is meant to be a refutation of Heidegger's theory of art. Okay. They don't say Heidegger's name at all the yeah. entire time. But that's, I think that's what structures the whole chapter from start to finish. So if you can, what, just briefly, Heidegger's conception of art, if, if you have anything there on it, then... Uh, I do. Right. If you want to speak to that, I, I'm not familiar. So, so uh, what he's pointing to is the... Heidegger or uh, Deleuze? What Deleuze is pointing to in Heidegger uh, is two, two, well, really three examples, but two that matter uh, from on the origin of the work of art. First is the Greek temple, uh, uh, that's possibly a temple to Hera, uh, where he describes it as having lost its historical milieu. The quote is, it's world withdrawn and world decay can never be reversed. This Greek temple is irretrievably lost because the culture that surrounds the temple is irretrievably lost. Right, uh, right. And part of the point of this chapter is to take this conception of the classical, this idea of world withdrawing, as if this is somehow impoverished, and to show how this is a creative engine. Right. This is mm -hmm. a way, this loss of one space is actually a way out into a new one. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second example he gives is Van Gogh's shoes, where Heidegger says the shoes are a thing, it's a bearer of traits, unity of a sensory manifold, and it's formed matter, um, and he's got a lot about this strife between the earth and the world, and he gets really convoluted, and, you know, whatever. Uh, but Deleuze wants to challenge this. He actually quotes the painter Millet, and he says, what counts in painting is not what a peasant is carrying, whether it's a sacred object or a sack of potatoes, but its exact weight. The earth swings itself over, tending to take on the value of pure material for a force of gravitation or weight, which is to say that Heidegger's view is stuck in classicism, in romanticism, and that he can't properly understand modernism. He can't understand this idea that there might be a way out, that there might be some kind of creativity that's possible in response to the classical and the romantic. Yeah, and you know he wanted to go live in the woods. <laughs> he could, he he had nowhere else to go. His world was deprived in a right. very real sense, and he couldn't imagine a kind of creative solution. Yeah. To that. Yeah. Depriving of the world. Because I guess towards the end of his life, all he all he was seeing were, you know, the emergence of discos and these other kind of. It'd be wrong to say superficial, but certainly not what Heidegger would have had in mind that would constitute a possible coming out of or, or escaping from. But it seems to me, then, that the following, or what, I, what I'm seeing here out of Deleuze and Guattari, is interesting because there is a suppression to that where it's not necessarily from Heidegger, but there so, does seem to be something of a resistance to this possibility of becoming or this, this sort of... Um, uh, this this opening up of possibility, and it comes out when they when they write this on page three forty five. The established powers have occupied the earth. They have built people's organizations, the mass media, the great people's organizations of the party or union type are machines for reproduction, fuzzification, machines that affect effectively scramble all the terrestrial forces of the people. The established powers have placed us in the situation of a combat at once atomic and cosmic galactic. Many, arti uh, many artists became aware of this situation long ago, even before it had been installed. For instance, Nietzsche, as being just one of those people that were able to, that, you know, saw the advent of whatever you'd call this. Uh, I don't know if we have the same, oh, I think we do have the same copy. I want to say 345. 45? Yeah, the chapter starts with, material thus has three principal characteristics. Midway down the page, but it's the same one. I don't think it's the same. It's the fuzzy comment? Yeah, the fuzzy comment. Yeah, whatever. What is that? There's something to say about there. 
Here, I'll pause this. Yeah, so, fuzzification machines. So one of the things he's talking about, right, is this transition from the romantic to the modern. Right. And he sees the modern world as being in the most Nietzschean sense, right, beyond good and evil, that there is this great artistic championing of being able to control every variable, to being able to make every kind of change that's possible, to control the molecular in right. every kind of way. Um, and yet, this becomes very insidious for him, because this is not simply that one is able to, as an artist, produce anything, but that the people, the, the molecular forces that constitute the people, themselves become vulnerable to control. Uh, there's something very dangerous about this, and I think there's something very dangerous about Deleuze in not Preparing his texts well enough against this danger. Mm. Uh, he suffers from a problem very similar to Nietzsche, which is that he's very open to every kind of interpretation. Right. And he loves right. that. He right. thinks that's the greatest thing about his work. But it's really dangerous. Mm. Because you can have, with very few changes an incredibly right-wing Deleuze, an incredibly totalitarian Deleuze. Yes, yeah. accelerationist type Deleuze. Exactly. Uh, and it's it's even here. I mean, it's the, the politics of it spreads out into this very problem of machines are for reproduction, scrambling all the terrestrial forces of the people, just to say that the people is no longer organized on the level of the territory, but on the level of the molecular. Right. And what's being made visible in modern art is the very controls over the people. Mm -hmm. And this isn't some radically new change. I mean, this isn't a historical development. This has always been the structure of the refrain. There's always been that manipulation of the people on the molecular level. But it's maybe at a point where that intensity has grown so large that this can be said to be a modern era. Right. And then the three the three uh, aspects of it would, you know, I think you're right not to attach it to some sort of temporal significance or, or perhaps to be cautious about attaching it to a certain historical epoch or, or, or in, some, in some form like that. But I'd la I'm interested in your, how you look at Deleuze's failure, if we call it that, um, to account for the possibility of his work being perceived in such a way, because, like you say, it can very easily be read in in any way. On on you know reading this, as I just did, it seems to me very much like something that can be taken up as, you know, left wing, hippie type. You know, to use all the basic terms to try and describe how this can be taken up. But even in that respect, there's there is something of a um, of a danger to it. If I if I can, you know, entertain this critique of this Deleuze side a little bit, in that it seems appropriative. It seems like it doesn't necessarily respect boundaries in some way or other. And I'm wondering how you could think about that, or if that is just an affirmation of what you've said, uh, in relation to the musical refrain. Because how I read the musical refrain is being in between, in a sense, and I guess operating in the milieu, or being that sort of um, the enunciative type performances that extend or reach. In the, the, the kind of tentacles of the Deleuzean tentacles into those other spheres and perhaps it doesn't catch anything but it does in a sense imply that there can, it can reach over whether it comes out in the process of becoming or you know these uh, the machine machinic type 
not machining assemblages because those terms don't aren't exactly the same, but how the the machine kind of propels something into uh, another space. So I'm wondering if, and if I'm totally off base with that, then don't be shy. <laughs> Put me in my place. Oh no, I mean the the language he uses right is the assemblages. The thing that gets cut by a machine okay. and intersected with another assemblage. Um, the machine is the thing that cuts through from one to the next. Right. Um, I think that there's a part of this text where he touches on this. I think it's worth looking at that. We should. So, he says, uh, he gives... He starts talking about the age of the machine and the introduction of the immense mechanosphere, the plane of cosmicization of forces to be harnessed. Um, and he starts talking about this composer, Edgar Varese, uh, who wrote a whole bunch of theory about the kinds of, thing, kinds of machines he wanted to have built for music. Uh, and he demands a sound machine rather than a machine for reproducing sound. Uh, in fact, calls for a synthesizer 50 years before a synthesizer is built. Um, and the synthesizer opens up, as an instrument, it opens up the possibility of being able to control any element of the sound. Anything becomes a parameter. Anything can be changed. Uh, something is fixed only because you aren't changing it with the synthesizer. And the other... To Kind of cut in the the other term they use is uh, in relation to Cage's prepared piano. Mm -hmm. So prepared piano, you know, that's like you put forks and stuff in the, in the actual base of the piano or whatever you call the back of it with the strings to manipulate the sound. Yeah. So it turns a note. What would be normally when you strike the key and you'd hear a sustained note, that sustained note no longer appears, and right. so all you get is the abrupt cut from the piano. Uh, and he starts talking about. One of the things that comes out of this way of making music with something like the synthesizer is that there's an ambiguity to it. Uh, and he compares it to children's drawings, um, text by the mad, concerts of noise, uh, which is that it's very possible for this to just decay into total randomness, just changing every variable to just make these sort of massive jumbles of sound and lines and it has no organization you just end up back in chaos uh, a material that is too rich remains territorialized on noise sources on the nature of the object this even applies to cage's piano uh, he calls this opening up music to all events all eruptions but all you end up with is a scrambling that prevents anything from happening. And I think this is what comes out of the tentacular reading of the words. This idea that you can just connect anything at all. That there isn't some kind of mechanism that stops one connection from happening. Stops any machine from cutting into any other assemblage. Uh, and you end up with people like, uh, what are often called joyful Delusians who just free associate word slurries because they can uh, right. because they feel validated by Deleuze's work uh, but he's not saying these aren't fixed things he's actually very much trying to articulate that there is a rigidity we're not over classicism we're not over giving something a fixed form that's necessary to allow meaning to happen at all. You can't have a territory unless you have some semblance of form. Uh, so I think there is an attempt there to make a resistance to this. Uh, and I think it takes a lot of digging into the text to find those moments where he gives some level of fixity. Uh, yeah. yeah, even on, I guess, even in the level of language and the terms that he uses. So I think of like territorialization or deterritorialization, right? And the sequence would go in very basic forms as follows. 
where you have a territory and from that territory you have some sort of process of becoming or deterritorialization. And then he says that wherever that that deterritorialization leads, let's say it's in the form of becoming animal, becoming woman, becoming nomad, terms that we could probably problematize, but for now we'll let it slide. Um, in that process, the object of the becoming, the woman, animal, nomad, is then deterritorialized because it doesn't have in itself. It'd be wrong to say that th those things constitute a, a molar form, if you will, that is then never changing, but that it is something that is perhaps always already in this process of changing, but serves metaphorically as this sort of position in relation to oneself or position to something that is like a, a, a venue for change or a venue for that being different. I think you missed a step there in that articulation and that first step is crucial which is that before you have a territory you must have ground. So he says before you can so the, the example he gives, um, or maybe one of the examples he draws from a biologist uh, here is the difference between a territorial mark and occupying a place. Uh, and there are some animals that, like a cat that, or, or a dog, that will go around the area where they live, and they will piss around the barrier yeah. and territorialize it, mark it off as their space, create an organization of an already established ground. And that's key, is that this site is already there. It's already fixed. It's already been not chaos. The cat has already organized it as objects, spatially, there's things it wants to hunt, and it then creates the territory in order to mark off which things are its to hunt and which are others. Um, this is why he becomes so obsessed with bird songs uh, as a good way to articulate territory, uh, because two birds in the same space of the same species, when they chirp, it's going to be on the same frequency. So they'll interfere with each other. So they have to be far enough apart to avoid interference. Uh, but the ground already has to be established. There already has to be a frequency in order for this to happen. There already has to be uh, vocalization and all of the biology that comes before that. Um, and I think that's really important to stress before you begin even to articulate what uh, territorialization and deterritorialization, re-territorialization might be. Uh, because there's already a fully rich biological evolutionary world that Deleuze occupies. Uh, and to sort of miss that is to stumble back into a space like Heidegger's, where Heidegger does not care about the real world. He does not care at all about biology, materiality, except insofar as he can digest it into his theory of being. Yeah, like hammers. And yeah, and it's, oh, all art is about equipment. Well, yeah, of course, because you think everything is equipment. All right. No, that's, I, th I think that is really important, and I think that that, you know, is how you um, sort of the term I'm looking for is kind of preemptively, but not preemptively, you prepare uh, God, what's the word? You prepare for the possibility of someone saying, like, yeah, you know, Deleuze is this thinker of total possibility, total becoming, always in the process of becoming, always, always already deterritorialized. When in fact, no, and and it really comes out in like his commitment to scientific research. Like, there, there's, or you know, I kind of use that in quotes, like scientific research. Like, we, you know, we can interrogate that a little bit, but he does stick to a very real-world model and what is going on in the world, what kind of research is coming out of this world, this kind of observational-type method. And I know that there are 
people thinking about that in relation to Deleuze, to, to Deleuze because he has a very rich uh, association with like science. He, he's you know he uses these kinds of he uses them as a lot of scientific research as metaphors as, as ways to propel his own argument. And in doing so, I think what you, what you've done is really elaborately or very um, you elucidated it very well in that there are parameters there. There are limits in a sense that you know don't necessarily allow for this I don't want to say don't allow because that would be a little bit a little bit harsh but uh, certainly put restrictions on you know what can constitute I don't know if restrictions the right, right word but something like a res, there's at least a resistance there's a pushback yeah. yeah it's not so simple to go from one assemblage to another oh you can just Cut it with a desiring machine. Everything's tentacles. Everything, you know, it's the yeah, network. Yeah. Well, no, there's hierarchy here. There's fixity. Uh, there's one must produce a machine. Yeah. A machine does not simply happen, and this production has to happen on the level of materiality, biology, physiology. However you want to, whatever term you want to use to designate the kind of material that you're using to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there must be a real molecular milieu in which this is happening. Yeah. And that, and how what he writes about that, this is on page, for, on my page 349, on your page it might be later on, um, so maybe four pages after where you found that previous one that we were looking for. But he writes this, not that a folk song, bird song, or children's song is reducible to the kind of closed and associative formula we just mentioned. Instead, what needs to be shown is that a musician requires a first type of refrain, a territorial or assemblage refrain, in order to transform it from within, deterritorialize it, producing a refrain of the second type, as the final end of music, the cosmic refrain of a sound machine. So, there are a couple things that w we can unpack there, but I'm curious... And this is, this is me just kind of entertaining my own curiosity, is how you conceptualize this thing called the cosmic in Deleuze, or in this text. Because I don't know how it varies in other, other texts, if it, if it comes up. Um, but how the cosmic, in this sense, points to something... Because you, you, uh, you equated it, of course, with the modern, with that kind of move away from... The classical from chaos, and if you know, if you have anything to say to that, so there's a distinction that can be made between chaos and the cosmic, though he sort of undercuts this distinction by drawing from Joyce and this the chaosmos, the, the literal blending of the two. Uh, but chaos is precisely the instability from which a ground is created. Having established the ground, having fixed a space as your territory, in fixing that, there becomes an outside world. There becomes a, a, a beyond your territory. And to come to understand what the cosmic is, or to, to let cosmic forces be rendered, is to depart from one's territory, to venture forth uh, on home on the thread of the tune, uh, to take something from its place, bring it somewhere new, and transform it to make a new space by revealing the variables that constituted it in the first place. Something that was already yours, already in your territory to begin with, but not seen as that. Uh, so the, to return to Messiaen, the analysis that's given of what Messiaen's bird songs is, um, he calls it a deterritorializing of the bird song. And what Messiaen's doing in his compositions is he says, uh, I listen to a bird song and I try to transcribe it. But the problem with a bird song is that the rhythm is too fast. Uh, its heart beats, beats must. Its heart beats faster, and its nervous reactions are much quicker. It sings at an extremely brisk tempi 
absolutely impossible for our instruments. So, we must slow it down so that we can play it. Uh, its pitches happen too fast. Uh, its, its pitches are too high. Uh, so we have to notate it in octaves that are lower. Uh, but, its pitches are also not fixed into a chromatic scale, so you can't play it on the piano. So you have to find octaves on the piano that evoke the pitch that the bird has. Just revealing those things about the piano, the structural features of the piano, the biological features of the human body, the biological features of the bird's body, to reveal these cosmic forces, these that we would label as organic, we might label as aesthetic or um, physical, but Deleuze will call cosmic because they're emerging already from an ordered system, but expanding it beyond what it was. Yeah, absolutely. That. Okay, so now that makes me think of something else. So if we, the refrain then, in the bird song, because I interpret I, I feel like it can be interpreted in a number of ways, don't get me wrong, but I want to, if I think of it in this following way, the bird song is sort of like an enunciative, performative, um, I will say affirmation of a space, in a sense, and as you were saying earlier with uh, how if two birds are in the same space, they're going to have their, their uh, frequency or their pitch will, will match, in a sense, or they, they should. So in that way, it strikes, it seems as though the refrain is something of the establishment from between chaos and the cosmic, or what allows the cosmic to develop. So from chaos to the sort of territorialization or re-territorialization or the establishment of that type of space or ground, uh, that, that other term you used. But in the, at the same time, it seems as though the refrain, in doing so, because it serve such an interesting role in establishing that that sort of base is in itself inextricably linked to that you know that that uh, coming into the cosmos or whatever that might be so what goes I, <laughs> an impossible question for sure but what goes beyond that is it what how would we then manifest the uh, the next refrain or or you know in the example you gave was you know, thinking about the piano in different terms. Or the other uh, example they give in another chapter is the difference between chess and go. Where chess, you know, very kind of blocked off. Like everything has its purpose or whatever. Whereas go, in their words, is pure strategy. I think it's the term they use. Is there a go to the refrain as the go to chess? So the assemblage that he points to as the defining assemblage of a modern refrain is the synthesizer. Right, okay. Uh, because the synthesizer is a deterritorialization of the piano. Right. Is a revealing of all these classic molecular forces and intensities already at work in the piano and taking all of them and turning them into variables. So, you don't simply have the chromatic scale yeah. on the piano, mm -hmm. uh, on a synthesizer from the piano. You have every pitch in between. It becomes about what kind of uh, hertz you can produce out of your speaker, uh, what the lowest and highest range of the speaker is. Uh, it becomes, amplitude becomes a thing you can manipulate in all different kinds of ways, not simply hitting the key softly, or hitting the key harder. Uh, even with the prepared piano, it's a deviation from the piano, but it's still fundamentally of the structure of the piano. It's not a proper, full deterritorialization. It's not a new refrain. Um, they borrow this somewhat from uh, Simon Dor uh, and his concept of the technical object where Simon Dole talks about how new technical objects develop and says uh, the development of a machine is not simply 
adding new subparts to an old machine to make it better. It's when the tensions at work in the machine collapse into something new entirely. Uh, so the combustion engine is not simply a variation on the steam, uh, on the sort of old uh, like water mills and steam power. It is a completely new way of generating power where the very motion of the engine heats it up and in heating it up makes it work more efficiently. Um, so there must be a real serious transformation of the molecular forces that underpin it in order to constitute a sort of new refrain, a new territory. Yep. And so, and this is probably another one of those uh, critiques that can come out against this, because, you know, if we think of like advanced industrial capital, it seems as though there'd be an, a very prominent connection between this sort of opening up of machining possibilities at, with the development of, you know, advanced capital, which, you know, the accelerationists would love. Like, yes, absolutely, we have to drive this thing further, this, this machining type apparatus. But, you know, we can, we can talk about that, but I, before that I have a, I have a question. It's, so if the, what the pr prepared piano is, or what the synthesizer is to the piano, is in a sense that sort of break into the cosmos, or like that, that extending further, or well, first of all, is that safe to say, you think, like the, how the... He calls it a cosmic machine. Cosmic machine. Or a machine of cosmic forces. Right. The piano in itself is, is a sort of like, um, would be, I don't know what the term would be, it'd be like um, a molar entity, I guess, in a sense, it is, it is something of a diagrammatic type place from which the synthesizer is able to achieve its, n not, its kind of um, differentiation from it. Because once you've established a territory, it's only once you've done that that you can then establish that, oh wait, I'm, I'm above, or just using the term above, but being outside of it, only once it's been established. So in that way, is there in Deleuze here still a commitment in a sense to that limit where it's like, okay, we still, the piano is the limit, just, it, it can be anything. But then by establishing there being like the cosmic machine that comes after it, does it dichotomize or perhaps bifurcate something, uh, uh, something of a transcendental, which is a scary term for Deleuzeans, I'm sure, but a transcendental and a you know, material or basic yeah, I think this is a criticism that's levied, or, or maybe not criticism, but a comment that's levied a lot on this chapter in secondary literature, which is that there's a certain privileging going on here of the synthesizer. Right. Uh, that the privilege of the synthesizer comes from the historicity of Deleuze's own position and own moment in time. Okay. And I think he sees it as it's the cosmic machine only because it's the machine of that moment, that point in time. Um, and it really only has that position because it's in its sort of most developed uh, state. Yet, when time passes, when history moves on, what intensities we find important are going to change. And that's going to sort of change the criterion by which we come to judge what a cosmic machine might be. Right. Uh, and to frame it in terms of sort of the molar and the molecular, right, the, or, or the major and the minor uh, in the linguistic chapters, you could say something like the piano is a, a major language, and the prepared piano is a minor one, right. but the, the synthesizer is a new major language. Yeah. And one of the questions worth interrogating is, what are the minor languages of it? Yeah, and yeah. 
I think that's where a lot of the interrogation of this chapter can be made into the status of becoming woman and becoming child and the privilege he gives to these with respect to the refrain and with respect to music um, because it still traps him very much in a romantic conception of music. Okay. Um, can, can you say more about that? I'm, I'm interested. <sighs> so the, the stuff is mostly from the chapter before, from the plateau before this one. At the coming animal, uh, becoming, the becoming animal, intensity, becoming intensity, yeah. uh, where he starts talking about the relationship of the refrain, and um, he's talking about Wagner, and there's another composer whose name is Vendi, maybe. And you could have been, um, been the Ita uh, fascist compo composer picked up by the fascist. Um, For no reason. It was a coincidence. Vendi, maybe. Remember my. Yeah. So, one of the things that happens with Romantic era music is the revival of the distinction between man and woman. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. And this bifurcation. And um, one of the ways this gets articulated is that pre Romantic, there isn't a bifurcation between. Female and male, there's just, there's not gender, it's just this sort of amorphous thing, and it's only in the romantic space that this division happens, and um, there's a lot to be said in this chapter about the relationship of uh, Lacanian psychology to what they're articulating here, um, and I don't really want to go into that, but, because it's a whole can of worms that is unpleasant and sexist and... The problem is, they don't levy any kind of criticism against this. And they don't take any critical stance against the way the figure of the feminine, the figure of woman, is used. Uh, so I think at least eight examples they give in this chapter are songs about a man murdering a woman. Oh, really? No. Which is extremely unpleasant when yeah. you try to trace out those texts. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's just this constant repetition of like, oh, yeah, how is territory defined? Well, it's defined by the murder of a woman. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's not a helpful yeah. position. Yeah. And I think that's where the, the push against... Deleuze can happen, and a push against a major minor language um, tension can happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. like, other than being, you know, extremely transphobic, like, there, there, there's no, no space for that here, I don't, I don't think. Um, but I think it's interesting, because when we, when we think of you know, Deleuze is the thinker of becoming, like, deterritorialization, whatever. We can't forget that, you know, he's coming out of this, this canon, right, in the musical world, the science world, whatever, um, that is so overwhelmingly sexist, so overwhelmingly racist, like, there's, there's, there's no, like, redeeming that. So we have to wonder to what extent we're going to fall into those traps, or perhaps... Perhaps it's not, you know, we have to give him more credit, but we can't necessarily just let him off the hook as being like, you know, the thinker of becoming or the cool hip dude of, you know, speeding anuses and flying vaginas or however the passage goes toward the beginning. Um, but it's important to t interrogate it nevertheless. I think the credit that is to be given to him is that the problem he sees with music in the 21st century is its relationship to Nazism. Okay. And yeah. uh, and very much the problem of Heidegger. Yeah. Uh, and I think he does a very good job of undermining the aesthetic tradition of Heidegger. I think he does a very good job of showing that there are figures who completely disrupt uh, the 
fascist use of art. Yeah. Um, so the start of the chapter right, is The Twittering Machine by uh, Paul Clay. Right. Yeah. And that's not by mistake. Yeah. Uh, Heidegger was, after he'd written uh, on the origin of the work of art, started thinking about wanting to write more on art. Uh, so after the war, he went and saw an exhibit of degenerate art. Um, one of the figures there is Paul Clay. Uh, and he saw in Clay a kind of art that his own project couldn't possibly include. I see, yeah. And, uh, in fact, started thinking about writing a second, uh, a second part of On the Origin of the Work of Art meant to deal with Clay's work yeah. and ended up abandoning the project altogether I see. because he, he didn't think it was possible. It, it totally ruined his system. <laughs> uh, nice. And the fact that they begin this chapter very much with, a little slap in the with face. Clay is, is a direct aim yeah. at Heidegger, yeah. is, is that this is not this is not going to be like that. This yeah. is going to be a departure away from that. Yeah. And uh, an attempt to find a way to undermine these kinds of things. Um, or, or at least to explicate why music can be so vulnerable to fascism. Yeah. And, and when thinking about animals in this chapter as well, he says, uh, on my page 315, uh, he says that what defines territory is the emergence of matters of expression, in brackets, qualities. Take the example of color in birds or fish. Color is a membrane state associated with interior hormonal states, but it remains functional and trans transitory as long as it is tied to a type of action, sexuality, aggressiveness, flight. Which is... You know, I, this, I, I have trouble at times with this sort of commitment to what seems to me like this kind of, these evolutionary type, um, or these Darwin, Darwinian uh, observations that Deleuze and Guattari are picking up on at the same time, because, you know, we think of these critiques of this Heideggerian privileging of, like, the, the romantic, or thinking about things only in, not being able to conceptualize things beyond that. And then it's like, at the same time, Deleuze and Guattari are, are also committed to this, what I'll call it, Right, conservative model, but I are able to do really fascinating things with it. So it's like they 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 aren't like you said at the beginning. It's not as though Deleuze and Guattari necessarily move past the chaos or the or the romantic. Like it's always already there. So in that sense, it's like we aren't gonna you know totally do away with Heidegger or what Heidegger is looking at in a sense. But look at how. We can do other interesting things with this. How this can go in other interesting territories that perhaps is not as fascist, is not as scarily committed to, you know, these totalitarian type structures or these micro fascisms, and and anything of the sort. And how there, you know, there are these kind of parameters, these limits established that are worth considering, but how they aren't limits. Period. Period. They, you know, there are limits that, you know, circumvent themselves, that, that go beyond themselves, that it's like a metaphor, you know, it keeps going. But one would hope, right, that one wants to extend a certain amount of charity to Deleuze and Guattari, right, and say, perhaps you're committed enough to truth, you're a, fr to use sort of Aristotelian language, you're a friend to truth in such a way that you will love those of us who come at you and want to dismantle what we see as impoverishments in, yeah. in Deleuze's work and Deleuze and Guattari's work, uh, and that, that they would be open to that kind of uh, overcoming of problems. Um, but who knows? You know, I, I, Maybe they're sexist enough, after all, that they wouldn't like that, but maybe we should be charitable to them. Yeah, yeah, I, I, th there are moments when it's hard, but at the, at the same time, it's, you know, I like to be optimistic about it. But for them, and this is another passage they have, where they say that art 
or the artist, colon, the first person to set out a boundary, set out a boundary stone, or to make a mark, in a sense, the first person to give us this idea of territory or whatever. Which, thinking now, it seems ironic that Plato would want to have banished all the poets, like, or the artists, if they are the people that give it this, give, open up the possibility for there to be a territory, to be a space, to be a mark, to be a, um, a stone. So there, but for Plato and the Republic, not to, not to sort of go off well, we can, too far into that, but for, for Plato and the Republic, the, and, and its accompanying text, um, the Sophist, the, pro the reason he has to throw the poets out, um, the demand to throw the poets out, is because pictorial representations, as he sees them, don't have any fixity. Mm. They are too open. They're purely chaos. And the only way to give fixity to images is to find a way to territorialize them, to find a way to say there is, there are images that have truth, yeah. and there are images that don't, yeah. and to delimit one from the other, and to mark out the city mm -hmm. and say, yeah, get, get get the chaos out of here. Yeah, it's not that we want poets out of here; we want the chaos out of here. But the poet is a. a machine that cuts through his mechanism for truth, cuts yeah. through his system. Um, and so even, I think even Plato here can be said to agree with, with Deleuze in the way that he wants to construct these things, to say, yeah, there is some form here. But again, Plato, Plato's forms are transcendental, yeah. Plato's forms are, yeah. there, there's no form of mud. Yeah. There's the one and the many and the same and uh, but for Deleuze the forms are the uh, the spider the tick the um, the arachnian yeah the, yeah yeah the, yeah absolutely and we're ready to talk about rhythm now he makes this distinction between meter and rhythm. And he, he tries to say, okay, look, r rhythm isn't what he calls the military march, or jazz, which is, that second one is, I don't want to get into the problems associated with that, discussing that. Yeah. But um, the, the military march reference here, you know, it's, it's rhythm conceived of as the, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two, is not what he means. Um, there's actually an a interview with um, Karl Heinz Stockhausen uh, that's referenced near the end of the chapter. And in that interview, uh, Stockhausen says uh, he can't tolerate regular rhythm because it makes him think of Nazi marching songs ah, playing yes. endlessly on the radio in his childhood. Which brings us back to the very first page of the chapter, where the second part of the refrain is the construction of territory. And while the example given is the housewife who uses the marches to do the cleaning, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. we can see how the Nazi marching song blasted on the radio uh, is a way of territorializing Germany, is a way of fixing Germany in a particular repetition, a meter a fixity so that it stays the same. Mm -hmm. um, and so what he means by rhythm here is precisely the opposite of this. Right, uh, right. Yeah. The, the breaking away from the one, two, one, two, uh, to permutations to the refrain in its original Italian sense of the end of a madrigal that is a line that has no repetition whatsoever. Uh, because the only way you're going to move from a territory to a new space is by something that never repeats. 
so that it never reinstates that territory elsewhere. Interesting. Yeah, I like that. That that makes a lot of sense. And so we think of um, various territories, okay, and in, in between conceiving of uh, or thinking about the milieu and the tentacle thing. So repetition serves in a sense to establish a space and to maintain a certain space. How do you then move with the refrain or, okay, I'm, I'm going to frame it in this way. How does the refrain differ here, the refrain differ with relation to rhythm? How do they use it to render it productive in the form of a deterritorializing or machinic type uh, propulsion? A squid moves by having an organ that pushes at water, jets it out from the squid, and that propels it to a new space. Yeah. This is sustainable only because water cannot be compressed any further than it already is. So the stability of the water, this metric repetition of the same level of pressure in the water is what sustains the squid moving from place to place. My mind was so blown, I'm dropping shit. <laughs> That's fucking interesting. Uh, and this is, I think this is all he's trying to get at, is in order to go somewhere, in order to do something new, a certain level of stability is required. Something to move away from but something that's held in place long enough to move away from it. Um, you just blew my fucking mind. That was, that's, uh, that's, that's interesting, Sparkles. That's, uh, I'll be thinking about that in my sleep. Okay, but uh, keep, keep going. If you have more on that, I'm, I'm incredibly interested. So a lot of this is derived from... Uh, maybe the thing to say is, go read... <laughs> Go read Difference of Repetition. Yeah. Because Difference of Repetition is entirely about how something new comes out of the repetition of the same. Okay. Uh, so, a lot of what's happening in A Thousand Plateaus is he's taking this ontological structure that he's worked out in Difference and Repetition and trying to show how that structure works no longer on the level of memory pure ontology, uh, a sort of almost pre-molecular level, and is now showing how this works its way all the way up to capital, to the, yeah. Whole, yeah. the whole global structure of what he will eventually say, just to the cosmos, yeah. like, that this extends all the way out to the cosmos. Um, there's a biologist that Guattari cites who goes through and looks at some kind of worm that's made up of 932 cells and basically wants to show how that's like really misleading to call a lot of these cells the same thing. Yeah. Uh, in which he goes through and does a historical analysis and a, a genetic analysis of each and every one of these 932 cells to show how they're all different. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the book, says, well, okay, look, everything's horribly complicated. Like, sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that is what an explanation looks like of a concept. Right. Um, and this, of course, is a, a play on Nietzsche, too, uh, and Nietzsche's rejection of Kant, where Nietzsche says, no, there's no thing in itself. There's just interpretations of something. Do you want to know what the thing is? Look at all of the interpretations of it. Right. And then you will know the thing. Yeah. You've looked at all of them. And, yeah. Uh, I think that's sort of what's what he's trying to get at here and what he's trying to do with what 
something new is and trying to look at what a new thing is from every possible level. And this is just its artistic permutation of what yeah, is a new work of art. Yeah, they're, yeah, m musicality, absolutely. I don't know, that seems like a good... That seems like a good send-off point, unless you have anything else, like any, anything else specific. No, that was... That was really good, Sparkles. That was, that was a brilliant way to end it off here. Well, for anyone still listening that made it this far, thank you. I hope that that was as illuminating for you as it was for me. I'm, uh, it's going to take me a while to, to digest that. But for any of you that did make it this far, thank you for listening. And if you have any beef with Sparkles or I, you know how to, how to do it. Or if you have anything to add, please, please do. And I hope that we'll see you soon. Great, thanks. Say bye, Sparkles. Bye. It was a pleasure.